Hello everyone and welcome to the studio. Here we are in the morning of Clay Share Con day two and we have a really exciting tutorial planned for you. We have Michael Harbridge joining us from Learn Fired Arts and he is going to be teaching you some banding methods. So you might not know what that is, but he's gonna show you right now. It's a really great way to add some surface decoration to your pottery. So, hey Michael, how you doing? Good Jessica, how are you today? I'm great, I'm so glad you're here with us today. Glad to be here again, thank you. We're excited to learn some banding methods. Yep, got lots of different ways to show everybody to do it on banding wheels and pottery wheels and different colors and brushes, lots of good stuff today. Fantastic, all right, let's do it. All right, all right, thanks everybody for joining me this morning. Um, I'm having a hard time staying here because I really want to get on a plane and go to Jamaica. If you missed the studio <laughs> tours this morning, go back and watch it. There's lots of really great studios and a lot of great views as well. So um, I want to start out today talking about different types of banding wheels. And um, a lot of people confuse turntables with banding wheels. And so things like those Rubbermaid Lazy Susans that you put in a cabinet that spices go on that spin around, those don't work real good for banding. Um, you want something ideally that you can get your hand underneath to spin is good. Um, there are, are banding wheels that are real low and those you have to kind of flick the top to get them to spin. Um, I like this one. This is one that Amico makes. Um, I've got these available on our website. It is a two-piece banding wheel um, and fairly affordable. And you can get your hand underneath to spin that banding wheel. The one that I love um, that is a little bit more pricey is the Shimpo banding wheel. And this is all one piece. And I kind of call this one the Cadillac. And I, I see a lot of times in studios, pictures and stuff, people have these. And, and they use them a lot of times just as a turntable. And they don't realize what they can do with banding methods with it. So this one is really nice and heavy duty. And when I give this a spin, it just keeps going and going and going because it's so heavily weighted. Where the lighter weight one from Amico, it works great, but it, it's not as heavy duty and as powerful. But this is what I started out on. Um, I graduated to this one. I'm also gonna show you guys today how to use a pottery wheel to do it too. I know a lot of you have wheels and you can do banding on there as well. So that's, the banding wheels. Let's talk a little bit about brushes. Um, a lot of uh, real soft brushes, things like mop brushes, fan brushes work really well. Um, and you want them to be real soft hair. Um, things like goat hair or synthetic goat hair works really well. Um, on the real big piece, I've got a really giant bowl over here. We're gonna use hockey brushes um, to do the banding on there. So soft hair, something that's gonna hold a lot of color is ideal. For doing fine lines, we're gonna to use today, I'm gonna to show you how to use dagger brushes. And there are synthetic daggers and there are natural hair daggers and there are soft um, synthetic daggers as well. So we'll talk about those when we get to that fine line type work. A lot of people want to use, they think of liner brushes for doing banding methods. And while these brushes are great for doing fine line work and outlining and lettering and things like that, they generally don't hold enough color to do a long continuous band. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Things like bamboo brushes, these actually will work pretty well because they do hold a lot of color and they generally will come to a pretty nice point as well. And so really it's about the, the amount of color that the brush holds that's gonna make a difference. So I'm gonna stick this lighter weight banding wheel aside and we're gonna work on the, the Shimpo banding wheel. And I'm gonna start out working on just a bare plate and then we're gonna go back and we're gonna do some fine line banding on the pieces that we did yesterday in the stamping workshop. Banding can be done with lots of different colors. And I know yesterday there were a lot of questions that had come up about different brands of color. And when I talk about colors, I try to explain in, in simple terms kind of what the color is. So um, if you understand like a fritted product versus a clay-based product, you'll have a better understanding of what will work and what won't. Um, so I'm gonna be working today again with some of the colors for earth, the color concentrates. These are basically a, a straight pigment with a binder in them. 
they're highly concentrated. So I can thin them. A lot of the techniques, you need to thin the color to get the fine lines. And so because these are so highly concentrated, they work really well um, with that. Versus like a three coat underglaze, something like um, a Mako fundamental underglaze or an Amico uh, velvet underglaze. Um, we're gonna use some of those underglazes on a bigger piece and I'll talk more about that. Um, but for doing fine line work, because you have to thin the color, think about the colors that you're using. If you take a three coat product, something that normally takes three coats to get opaque coverage, and you thin it with water, you're going to be diluting that. And so you're not even getting one full coat of it. And that's why I like things like the color concentrates. Um, Duncan makes a, an easy stroke line. Um, those are great for the fine line banding. What about products like stroke and coat um, concepts? Oops, I just dropped that color on the floor here. Um, what about things like stroke and coat? and concepts and fritted glazes. Um, you can do banding with those. And what um, is a little bit more challenging with that because it's a fritted product and it's kind of gritty, a lot of times as you're applying the color, your brush is getting kind of a layer or a gathering of some of that frit. And so when you lift the brush, sometimes you have kind of a little pile of gritty frit on there. And also think about these colors. They require three coats to get opaque coverage. And if I thin this down half with water and half color, I'm getting the equivalent of a half a coat. And so you have to do multiple layers on there to get good coverage. If you use a fritted product and you can use them, I just prefer something more concentrated or uh, an underglaze that's not fritted um, because it's, it's usually creamier where this, the, the grittiness of it, can create some challenges, but you can do it with that, with, with those type of products as well. So I've got just a stoneware plate here that I'm going to start out and I'm going to show you um, doing kind of a blended method of color. And I'm going to be working with several of the color concentrates. And I was talking to Paula yesterday and we were Paula McCoy who, who owns Colors for Earth and she'll be doing some demos for you as well. Um, we were talking about some of the purples and the pinks and how well they fire out at a cone five, cone six temperature. And we were talking about a zinc-free clear glaze versus a traditional clear glaze and how those will work. And so I'm gonna do this piece today and I'm gonna fire it tonight and we will see how these hold up. And I'm gonna do part of it with a zinc-free clear and part of it with just a traditional clear. So I'm working with um, her purple sage. I'm working with her bright violet, and I'm working with the blush Cabernet, and we're going to work with those three colors, because those are some of them, the purples and pinks. We wanted to see how they stand up to that firing. I'm adding Michael, a little bit of water. Uh, before you go further, we have some folks mm -hmm. asking what fritted means. Would you mind explaining to them so they understand what the term yeah, so refers fritted, to? Things that products that fire out glossy generally have frit, so frit is glass. And so it's finely ground glass to like a powder stage. And um, so if you think about a product that fires out shiny, something like stroke and coat concepts, if you put one coat of this on, you get a little bit of a shine. If you put two coats, you get more of a shine. Three coats, you get a nice glossy finish. So anything that's gonna fire out glossy or like a matte finish, like there are matte glazes, that have a little bit of a sheen to them. Those usually have frit in them as well. Um, so most of the time glazes like your stoneware glazes and things, um, you can band with them, but those are gonna be a fritted product and, and they just have a grittier, chalkier feel to them. I hope that answers. So yes. I've Thank added you. about half water to half color in my little cups here. And I'm gonna start out working with, um, a fan brush or a mop brush, generally, I like for this blending technique. And I'll kind of go back and forth between a few brushes. And I'm going to start out with the lightest color in the middle. And I'm just mixing this with my brush to get it nice and, and fluid and mixed well. And when I do the banding, you have to hold the brush out. And so I will often put a roll of paper towel next to the piece so I can balance and anchor my hand so it's up to the right height. 
And when I turn the banding wheel, my hand is underneath making this motion. So my finger is kind of pulling while my thumb is kind of pushing on the bottom pedestal on there. But you want to have your hand anchored and steady. Sometimes I will just put my elbow on the edge of the table and have my hand. But I find that if I'm coming downward like this in a roll of paper towel, a stack of books, whatever works well. You want to center your piece. Usually banding wheels have some type of lines on the top. And if I'm centering something smaller, I can set that on the wheel and I can kind of look at where those lines are and center the, pre the piece pretty well. But when you're putting something that's larger than the banding wheel on top, um, it, it's a little harder to see underneath to see where those lines are. Um, you'll notice I've got this rubber pad on top of my banding wheel. The banding wheels are usually pretty slippery. So um, putting a damp paper towel on top of here, just to prevent your piece from sliding. I've got these rubber pads. These are actually monoprint pads. And um, these I put on top because they're kind of like a silicone rubber and they're tacky and they stick to the wheel. And when I set my piece on top, my piece adheres well and it doesn't slip and slide. And then what you wanna do is you wanna take something stationary and I'll often use like a brush handle or my finger and I'll start the piece turning and I hold that stationary piece. And as it turns, wherever it's, it hits, I stop it and I slide it over slightly to be able to get the centered. And I continue that process until the piece is centered. And you have to remember when you slide the piece, if, if you feel like you're off an inch, you don't need to slide the piece an inch over. You go half of the distance that you think you need to go. If you go full inch, it's going to push it off on this side, and you're going to keep going in a vicious circle and never get that piece centered. And so every time it rubs, I just shift it slightly. And sometimes you'll have pieces that are a little warped, and they're not perfectly round, but you want to try to get them really close to being centered. And I think now, as I spin this, I'm looking at the space between the brush handle and the plate, and this, I feel, is, is centered well. I'll make sure that it's pressed down, that it's tight, and it's not going to slip and slide as I get that turning. So I've got my first color diluted. I'm going to put my, my roll of paper towel here and use that as my anchor. I'm going to completely load that brush, and I'm using a goat hair fan brush on here first because it holds a lot of color, but I also want to give this a little shake because I don't want to come across my piece and as I come across, have the color dripping all over. So completely load it and then kind of give it a little shake, a little rub on the side there. You want to start your piece turning. And I often tell people when it's very intimidating when you first go to do banding. And so I'll usually tell them to take a brush with water. So I'm going to take a fan brush here and practice first with water. So as I touch this brush down, I've got the spinning in the direction my brush is pointed. I can take that brush and I can set that down. And with water, I can visually see if I'm getting a nice banded line and that's gonna dry. And so you can sit and practice. When I first learned to do this, I sat for hours with brushes and water on a piece of bisqueware, just practicing doing that. Once you feel comfortable with the water, then you can go into your color. Get the piece spinning before the brush touches down. And you want the piece spinning at a, a fairly decent pace. You don't want it so fast that your piece is going to fly off of your, your banding wheel. But you don't want to go so slow that the wheel is hardly moving. And once you get a good pace with that, then you can take the brush and you can touch that down and band your color. And then I slowly bring the brush out until I get to the point where um, I want to go with that color. And you'll see that as I go out further and further, the brush starts to run out of color. If when you touch that brush down, if it just skips across the piece and you don't get nice coverage with the color, chances are your color isn't diluted enough um, or you don't have enough color in the brush. Um, when I lift the brush, and I'm going to go back and, and go a little bit further here, and I'll show you what can happen. If I band and I just abruptly lift the brush, not sure if it shows up in the camera, but you'll usually get a little puddle of color where that brush lifts. And so if you want a nice, smooth 
um, application without that line, as you lift that brush, kind of turn the brush on its side and bring it up on its edge so you don't have that puddle of color where you abruptly lift on that brush. And I can immediately go into my next color. I'm going to dilute this a little bit more. We had a question about the colors. Are they similar now what, to what they'll look like once they're fired? They are. The colors generally will, will brighten in firing. You'll get kind of a deeper, richer tone once you've clear glazed it and, um, and fire that. And some folks want to know how you're spinning the banding wheel. Yep. So it's my thumb is pushing and my index finger is pulling underneath. And so if I want kind of a translucent uh, look of the color, I don't have to apply several layers of that color. If I want a defined line, I can get a defined line between these two colors just by holding that brush in that one spot and I'll get a nice crisp line. If I want to create a blend of color, um, I'll, I'll go back and show you how to do that. In just a minute, I'm going to add some more of this color as well. And when I'm looking down at the banding wheel, I'm looking at where the brush is touching. My head is not spinning with that wheel. If you do that, you will just get dizzy and nauseous and probably um, fall over. So um, always look down where the brush is touching. And the brush, if, you, if you're watching, you'll see that the brush is staying in one spot. I'm not pulling that brush. The brush is not moving. The brush is just laying down. The only movement that I have is if I want to expand this and go further, the brush will go out in this direction. I'm going to go to my next color here, which is the deeper one. I'm going to dilute that just a little bit more. And you can see how even with these diluted, I've diluted these colors now probably about four parts water to one part paint. And you can see how nice and concentrated these colors are. Now this plate has, this is a piece of, of Mako stoneware bisque. This actually has a little bit of a ridge on the edge of this plate. So it's important that you have a nice soft brush and lots of color on there to get down into that ridge. And I can kind of work my way up onto the edge of this plate. We'll probably add a dark black band on the very edge here. Again, notice the brush isn't moving. I'm not pulling the brush toward myself. And that's one of the biggest things when I teach banding workshops is people have a tendency to pull that brush as they're going. And, and I usually will stop them and say, okay, you know, just watch what you're doing. And most people don't even realize it. I, I tell them, I say, this is kind of like, um, patting your head and rubbing your tummy. The one hand is doing this motion to get the wheel spinning and the other hand is doing this. And so a lot of times I say, just get used to that spinning motion first, do that for a little bit and then start patting your head, bringing the brush in with water first and, and playing around um, with water. Now I've got very defined lines of where these colors are. If I want to create a blend of colors. So if I want this darker purple to blend in and get more of a gradual blend of color, I can go back with some of that lighter purple color and I can reband this area. And I want to kind of work wet into wet as I do this. So I want to do this quickly. I'm going to kind of load this up with some of this lighter purple and I'll gradually pull that brush a little bit into the darker purple and pull the darker purple back in and kind of work where those colors meet up. Then I'm gonna load the brush with the darker purple, go back over the dark purple again, and then slowly introduce that brush into the lighter purple while the colors are wet. And I'll just kind of hold the brush in the middle where those two wet colors meet, add a little bit more of the dark purple and take it down into that lighter purple and just kind of working back and forth with the brush, I'm, I'm over-exaggerating this, going back and forth, but it's more of a slow, 
gradual. And then I can go back with the lighter purple and I can bring that into the darker purple. Michael, are you cleaning the brush when you switch colors? No, because there's by the time I'm going from the dark purple to the light purple, most of the colors pulled out of the brush. And because I'm creating a gradual blend of those two colors, um, I'm not worried about a little bit of the dark purple being in there with the light purple because I'm creating that blend anyway. If I want to create a blend between the lighter purple and the blush cabernet, I can go back and I gotta get a little more color out here of each of these. And I can do the same thing to create that blend. And a lot of folks are asking about the colors for Earth Concentrates. And I just want to remind everybody that Paula McCoy, who is the founder of Colors for Earth, is going to be joining us on Saturday and on Sunday with two demos. So if you have more questions about these products, she's going to be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Yep. And she she is ready for questions. And it's, it's a great line of products. I've used them for years and um, have had really good results and, and keep finding more and more uses for them. And she's doing a really cool clay flower bowl. And Paula's kind of known for like brush stroke work using these colors. And um, she's got some, some different stuff to show you and using them as washes and, and different things like that as well. I'm gonna work my way all the way back to the middle of this plate. And you can see the brush just slowly going out and then going back over into the, the medium purple, and then I kind of lift the brush up on its edge, and I get that nice blend of pink to more of a violet to a deeper purple on the edge of the plate. You won't get this the first time you sit down at a banding wheel. You're not, you know, people are always like, oh my gosh, you make it look so easy. And I'm like, it is once you've practiced. And so seriously, you guys, practice with water first, because that is going to um, make it a whole lot easier um, for you to, to practice without ruining anything. All right, so now let's do some fine lines. And so I talked about the dagger brushes and these are both synthetics. I used to use, it was a natural hair. It was a squirrel brush. And, and what I like about the squirrel or the softer synthetics is that they hold a lot more color where a, a gold Taclon synthetic um, the color doesn't, the, the synthetic doesn't have as much of a tooth to the hair. And so it doesn't hold the color as well. So it tends to release the color quicker. But the advantage to gold Taclon is um, it keeps its shape really well. It's not as floppy. So I'm going to work with the gold Taclon because that's usually what I recommend for most people to start out with is using the gold Taclon. And I'm going to go to the black, the color concentrates black, and I'm gonna thin this down. And the point of a dagger is that it holds a lot of color versus a liner brush. And you wanna completely load those bristles with color. Again, I give this a shake over my, my palette or my cup of color to make sure that I don't have a big drip of the color that's gonna come off on my plate. Again, I get it spinning. And then this, this has kind of a spear tip to it. So as I, touch that down on the piece, that spear tip is touching first. Now, if your plate isn't centered really well, or it's a little warped, this first band on the outside edge can be a little challenging. I always start inside a little bit. I don't go right on top of the edge because most pieces will have a little bit of a warp or you won't have them centered perfectly. So I concentrate on that inside line first. Once I have a nice crisp line on the inside, then I can take the brush up onto the edge. And sometimes I'll actually go onto the side of the brush to fill in that top edge on my piece. And again, because these colors are so concentrated, um, I can get nice opaque coverage um, with one coat or I end up doing multiple layers on here just because I need to get everything filled in. Now, if I wanna do a line inside of that and do a double band on here, again, get the wheel spinning and then take that brush, touch it down. 
and I can do multiple lines and look at how much color this brush holds and how many lines I can do before. And there's still color in here. I could keep going, doing more and more bands on this piece. The, the hard part with this, you guys, is you get nervous when you go to touch that brush down the first time. And again, work with water, get comfortable with it. If you mess up, wipe it off, go back over it, redo it. You might have your first few pieces that you know take a little bit of practice to be able to do that fine line banding. So I'm gonna set this one aside and I'm just gonna grab um, this bowl we did yesterday in, in the stamping. And if you didn't get an opportunity to, to watch that, the recording is out there. You can see how the stamping part of this is done, but I wanna show you on a bowl where we're gonna be kind of banding on the inside. And then I'm gonna go over to um, my pottery wheel here where I've got a really big bowl set up and I've got a big vase set up and we're gonna use some different colors to band on there. I'm gonna show you uh, doing a large area. All right, I think I got that centered pretty well. Get my brush, I'm gonna band this one with the black as well. Now this, because Sorry, I'm uh, working on- Someone, oh, oh I don't wanna interrupt oh, you. Ahead. Folks are asking, how are you using the paper towel? Cause they see you have it and they're like, what's going on? Yeah, so this is just, I'm, let me slide this over and give you a better view. So I've got this here so that I can anchor my arm as, so that I'm raised up above the wheel. And so that's why I've got this roll of paper towel here. It's not for comfort. It's not for, you know, sometimes it might be a stack of books. It might be a mold. It might be a stack of boxes, um, whatever works for you. I just always happen to have usually paper towel here. And so that works well. Because now I'm working on the inside of the bowl, I'm kind of turning the brush instead of straight down, I'm turning it on its side like this to get on the inside. And I do the same thing. I work down a little bit like I did on the plate. I work down in a little bit to get a nice straight line. And then once I have that straight line, then I work my way up onto the top and fill in on the top of the piece. We had a Again, question, have you ever used Georgie's interactive pigments for this technique? I have not. I think that is something that I need to try. Has anybody else out there, maybe somebody else that's, that's viewing has, has used them and might have an answer on how they work for well, this? The pigments are not food safe. So okay. um, you wouldn't wanna do a full surface like a plate. Usually you okay. dilute them down um, and use them watery for texture, um, but or solid on sculptural pieces. Um, can be used on rims, I, you know, but they are not okay. food safe. So They're that could be, okay. yeah. But Georgie's doesn't rec recommend you test them if you're going to use them, but they they can't attest that they're food safe because they're so concentrated. Okay. But they're made with oxides, and it's a little different than what you're using. So now I'm just banding another line inside of that piece and this piece is done as well. So we'll fire these tonight. We'll see how those other colors work out on there. I'm gonna pivot the camera around here, both of the cameras around and get it down on my pottery wheel here so you guys can see all of this. I would have loved to have done a studio tour this year and I may do that next year. Um, I've had some challenges the last week with the, oops, got that one aimed down too far, with the accident I was in and I've been limited in a lot of the things that I can do. So, um, so I've got this bowl, this big bowl, this is about a 20 inch bowl set up on my pottery wheel. And I can use the rubber pad underneath here, or um, I've got a wet, paper, uh, wet washcloth underneath here so that my bowl doesn't slip and slide. And there are other forms out there for, for pottery um, that work well. And, um, but I, I don't want this to slide because sometimes you get going with that foot pedal and you get going a little fast with that piece and it really um, can, can fly off of there. I've done techniques where um, I've done uh, a spin art where you spin it really fast with the color on here and it, uh, 
it can fly off of there. And so sometimes when I'm doing a real fast spin, I'll actually wedge pieces of clay underneath to get that um, uh, to stay on there. So again, with this, I want to center this. And I know that this big bowl is a little bit warped. And so I'm not going to get a perfect center on here. But I want to show you guys using something like a fundamental underglaze or um, a velvet underglaze how that can work and how you can do large items. And then the last piece that I'm gonna show is doing it on a vertical piece. And it's gonna be one of the pieces that we're gonna use um, for the horsehair firing, one of the bases for that. So I've got some fundamental underglaze here and I wanna do a blend from white to blue on the edge. So I'm actually gonna take and pour a puddle of this right in the middle of my bowl and I'm gonna use a large hockey brush. And I'm just gonna to touch that down in that puddle of color and slowly bring that color out from the center. And when I was talking before about, you know, the differences between like fritted products and clay-based products. So generally three coat underglazes are a clay-based product and everybody has a different formula for them, but I, I just tell people when it's a three coat underglaze and it doesn't fire out shiny and it fires out dull like the bisque, it usually means that it is a clay-based product or it's at least it's not fritted. And so I, I really like the, the underglazes for doing large pieces like this because they're creamy, they're smooth and they're basically colored slip or clay that you're applying. So I'm just slowly, again, the brush is holding in one spot and I'm just slowly bringing it out. And I don't want puddles of that color on the piece. I'm gonna add a little bit more of the white here because I wanna work this up the side a little bit more. I'm gonna increase my speed a little bit. And I can, and you can feel when a bowl is, is warped a little bit, you can really feel that um, the brush is kind of going up and down on here as I come out to this edge. I actually had a mold made for this large bowl. I use this a lot in um, workshops. And, and sometimes when it's poured, we get a little bit of uh, a little bit of an uneven surface here because it's such a massive piece. So I'm going to take some of the King's Blue, the UG1. I got a brand new bottle of that here. Get the little oil cap off of it. And I'm going to pour this into a bowl because I don't want to do this on the edge. Or I don't want to pour it onto the edge. And I'm going to load this up. And now these colors, I generally don't dilute them. They normally take three coats. And on a really large surface like this, this is going to skip across a little bit. And I like to have that bowl of color right handy so that I can constantly reload this brush. And I wanna get good coverage on the outside edge here, get everything filled in. Sometimes you'll get a little dip in a piece and you have to apply a little bit more pressure to get that. And then I want to work my way into the white. And I really puddled that white on heavy so that the white stays wet. And you also saw me with a sponge before I applied the color dampening the wear. And so by dampening it, it prevents the colors from drying and it keeps this color wet a little bit longer so I can work with the blend. Now this brush has a lot of color in it. Um, so I'm gonna set this brush aside with the blue and I'm just gonna take the brush that had the white and I'm now gonna work back and forth to blend these two colors together. So I'm going to drop this brush in the white and I'm going to kind of slowly pull that up into the blue. And sometimes you have to go back with the other color if it starts to get a little dry. And so I can apply a little bit more color and get this wet along this edge. I can do some of the white. Let me put that in a bowl here as well. And you want to work wet into wet to blend these colors together. I'm flipping the brush over because there's color on both sides of the brush. 
I'm going to reload this with more of the white. It's just a matter of kind of working wet into wet and, and being patient and pulling this color up into the blue and working the two colors back and forth. So now I'm overlapping the blue. I can go back with my brush with blue and bring that down and overlap into the white and just kind of hold it in that area. And I work back and forth just a little bit to create a blend. And if I want to take the blue further into the piece, I can slowly go down a little bit further, go back up, get that white into the blue, go back with white. Go back with the blue. And you can see that that blend is starting to work its way in really well. And I can drag this brush with a little bit of that blue down into the white, back up. And we've got our blend from blue to white in this bowl. And I'll probably take this one, I'll probably do some stamping or something on that. And I might even get this one fired tonight as well. I can also go back and do fine line banding on here. I won't do that. We showed that on the other piece. So I'm going to set this one aside and I'll show you quickly then doing a vertical piece. And so I've got this larger base. I'm going to redampen my washcloth here. Actually, I'm going to grab my rubber pad for on here. And on a vertical piece, you're going to hold the brush or stationary object next to the piece coming in from the side. And I had some blue on my fingers that I got on the side of this face. And wherever it touches, you're going to stop it and you're going to shift it the other way. Now, sometimes vertical pieces might be a little bit off. And so you, um, I usually kind of go toward the center of the piece and try to get it centered in the center, centered the center, that's kind of a mouthful. And on this piece, it's not a real big deal because I'm creating, I'm gonna create a blend of color the same as I just did on the bowl. And so on this one, I'm gonna work from, um, eh, we'll do the blue and the white since I've got those colors, I was gonna use another color on here. Um, but I'm gonna start with the white Applying that, since I can't pour it on, I'm really loading the brush up and I'm just going to do a small section. I would normally go all the way to the top with the white. And then I would start from um, where these two meet and work my way with the blue to the bottom. But I think you'll be able to see up further on the base if I do it this way. Um, basically doing the same thing that we just did on the bowl of blending wet into wet. You have to be careful because you can't apply as much pressure on a vertical piece as you can on a bowl or a plate or something that, that you're pressing down on. So I have to be careful that I don't press too hard on here or get it spinning too fast that I end up knocking the piece over or sliding it off center. But you can see the, the blend that's starting here. I go back with the white, blend that down into blue. This vase is really really warped. Gives it character. So let me stop this and I'll hold it up. So I would have continued working with white, continued working with blue, but we get that nice blend of color going, just working wet into wet on that piece. And so the horsehair pieces that I'll be doing on Saturday, this is that same large vase and I did a gradual blend from purple up to white. And then I did fine line banding on the top of here as well 
um, using the black color concentrates to accent the top of this piece. And that's just taking the dagger and working from the top. And so when I do that, sometimes I will anchor my elbow on my knee and be holding the brush like this. Um, a lot of times when you're working on a tall vertical piece, if it's a little, a little warped, um, you have to recenter it on the top. So I would start it spinning. And before I did that fine line banding on the top, I would make sure that it's centered up here. So initially I made sure it was centered in the middle to do my blend. If I'm gonna do fine line banding, I'm gonna make sure it's centered on the top and I'm gonna make sure that it's centered on the bottom. All right, any questions, Jessica? Probably a bunch. I've been keeping up with it and Paula's over on Facebook keeping up, which is helpful. Um, people are asking about your brushes. So the brushes you're using, they can get them all from you, from Learn Fire yeah, I've got the, the brushes and I forgot to mention yesterday the, um, the specials. So on my website, learnfiredarts.com, we've got all the brushes that, that I use today, the fan brushes, the dagger brushes, um, they're all on sale. And we didn't do coupon codes this year. Last year we did a coupon code for discounts and sometimes people forgot to put it in or the code didn't work for them or they didn't enter the right code. So this year we did a special section on my website. If you go to shop, the shop tab, the very first category that comes up is the Clay Share Con specials. There's all kinds of other stuff under the other categories, but I tried to put everything that I'm using this week in that category. Um, they're on sale and we also have free shipping in the US 48. Um, on any orders over $50. And um, I've got all of Paula's colors in there. I've got kits of all these different um, types of colors. And we've got free shipping domestically to the 48 states. If it fits in a flat rate shipping box, it's free shipping to Hawaii and Alaska. And we also have our website set up now to automatically calculate shipping for international orders. And a lot of international orders did come in yesterday. Um, so you don't need to email me again and, and say, hey, can you calculate the, the international cost? We redid the website, so all of that can be done now. Awesome. So just to be clear, when you were working on the banding wheel, you were using Colors for Earth concentrates. And then when you moved to your pottery wheel, you switched to fundamental underglazes from Mako. Yep. And, yeah. and I've done it with Amico's Velvet Underglazes and Duncan's Cover Coats and, um, you know, any, any clay-based underglaze really works well for doing banding on, on pieces as well. Fantastic. And then when you thin your colors um, down, your color concentrates or your underglazes, do you use tap water or distilled water, any special water? I just use tap water. I've never had problems here. Okay. If you've got you know water that has high iron content or something and, and you know that you might have some issues, then you might want to just buy a gallon of distilled water to do that. And then we had some folks that want to know, could they use mason stains for a similar technique? So, Yeah, and I, somebody had messaged me that yesterday, and I haven't personally worked with mason stains, um, but I believe that they, they probably would work for this technique as well. I think mason stains are probably the pigments that are used in a lot of underglazes to tint those, those colors. So play around they with them. They are. Yeah, mason stains are usually used to be, are usually added into a base of some sort. They're not usually used all by themselves, um, right. although you could do washes with them, but really they're meant to go in glazes and meant to go in slips and under glazes. But you could try them by themselves if you want to. They're usually very expensive and concentrated. That's why you um, add them into something else. You don't need a lot of them. Right. And you want to sieve them because they can be granular as well. So there's yeah. working with them. But if, you know, you want to give it a try. I think it's great to try all these different products and tools. Yes. I'm just going to hold up. This is some people were asking about what I'm doing for the clay puzzling technique tomorrow. This is the, the gnome bunny that we're going to be doing. Um, it's a, it's a wider, it's a new series of cones that we came out with too. So watch for that tomorrow. Exciting. And so you're, everything you were doing today is low fire that you're working oh, on right now. They're going to, a lot of those pieces are, are done on stone. You're going to go mid range. Okay. Yep. So, so but you can firing that purple plate and pink plate that I did and the leaf plate um, that that is mid range. I'll fire those tonight. That was mid range as well. And the um, the color concentrates can be used both on low fire and on mid range. So they, they do either of those. So depending on what you work with for your clay. Yeah. yeah and, and most of the colors hold up well at the mid range. And Paula will probably talk more about that. Sometimes some of the pinks and the purples might burn out a little bit the hotter you go. 
Um, and she does have a chart that kind of shows the results of, of a higher firing. And I'll be curious to see with the zinc-free glaze, um, if that makes a difference on some of those purples and pinks. I'm gonna fire that tonight we'll see tomorrow, I'll show it. And then uh, some folks are asking if they're gonna get a kit of the colors, what ones would you recommend? And you have them so on your site. I've got so several kits. Them. There's um, one ounce kits and two ounce kits on my website for the colors for earth concentrates. And each of those kits has different colors. And so you've got one ounce kits, two ounce kits. And then we do sell the black individually. And it comes also in, in paint sizes if you're gonna do a lot of, of work with that. The fundamental underglazes, we have kits with um, two ounce jars and paint jars. Um, and so, you know, it really depends on the colors that you're, you're looking for. But the kits are a good way to go because it gives you a good starter set. And I know a lot of people yesterday ordered these and there's, I think we have three different kits of the one ounce and two ounce with different colors. And then there's one master kit that has all of the colors in the one ounce and the two ounce in there as well. And those are all on sale and free shipping in the US pretty much on most of those. The small kits I think are about $45 they're on sale for. So you might have to add a couple brushes or something to get over that 50 to get free shipping in the US. You need brushes anyways. Uh, last question, yeah. folks wanna know what clear glaze are you gonna use over your banded pieces? So on the stone or pieces, I'm gonna do half of that plate with the zinc free and a regular clear just to see the difference on that plate. Um, on the leaf plate, I did these and these were fired. These are on stoneware. Um, this was done with, this one was done all with color concentrates and this was fired to cone five. And this was, I did zinc free clear on the, the back and the regular clear on the front. I didn't notice any difference in the color. And then on this one, I did stroke and coat on these leaves and color concentrates with stamping. And this was just using the, the regular clear glaze on it and fired cone. I do, I usually do cone five for my mid range. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. That's uh, all the time we have for this tutorial, but Michael's gonna be back with us. Um, so don't worry, he'll be with us tomorrow during doing a clay puzzling. So thank you, Michael. That was a really thank great you. tutorial on banding. It's all right, so now we've got new ideas for banding methods using our banding wheels or our pottery wheel to band our pieces. And also a little bit of an introduction to new products that you might not be familiar with, with the color concentrates, and that's Colors for Earth. And Paula McCoy, as I mentioned, is gonna be joining us Saturday and Sunday doing tutorials using her color concentrates, and you can ask more questions and find out more about those. Then, next, we have coming up at 11, a GR Pottery Form demo with Jeff, and he's gonna be sharing his wheel assist with you. So